a, uh, you know, it's an extraordinary day. We've got uh, a lot of notable people here as usual, and we are also in a position to recognize the fact that uh, we've been witnesses to a cusp, a lot of very important changes in society, one of which uh, we can highlight today with individuals such as Don Clark Netch and Judy Bar Topinka here, uh, both pathbreakers in their respective parties and in occupying uh, the positions that they did at the statewide level and in contesting the offices that they did. And today we're going to hear from Christine Rodonio, who has her own claim to historic accomplishment as the first woman in the history of our state to lead a legislative caucus. The Senate Republicans selected Christine Rodonio back in December. Uh, after that, there were some changes in Illinois. So when she came into office in January, she arrived with, let's say, the appointment of Roland Burris and the attendant controversy over that, uh, with the impeachment of our, the first impeachment of a sitting governor in the history of the state of Illinois, followed shortly thereafter by his trial in the state senate, her house of the legislature, and of course his removal from office, and then the ascent from lieutenant governor to governor of our friend Pat Quinn. We might say history withheld those unprecedented and historic events until the right woman for the job was there to handle them. That is nothing new. Senator Redonio has been the right person for the job many, many times in her career. In the early 1990s, out in LaGrange, she led a neighborhood revolt against a faulty plan for a new fire station, of all things. And that propelled her onto the village board of trustees in LaGrange. And shortly thereafter, as you know, some Democrats, some of our Democrat friends in the audience might find surprising, Republican Party officials actually tried to recruit an engaging, articulate, and attractive candidate for the state general assembly. So they knocked on her door and urged her to run for the House and uh, the state Senate, uh, which in 1996, after a couple of upsets, one in the primary and one in the general, uh, Chris was in fact elected to her seat in the state Senate. She was a stay-at-home mom in the early 1990s when she did that neighborhood revolt. Uh, earlier in her life, at the age of 16, she had graduated from high school. At the age of 19, she got her bachelor's degree over at Loyola and then became a master's of social work and a licensed clinical social worker. So in that way, adds a lot of diversity, not just in thinking, but in professional background to the Illinois Republican State Senate Caucus. So. Uh, what we have now is a legislative leader who's been pretty much removed from the state candidate mix for the year 2010, but I think with the record that we all now acknowledge, it won't be long before we're hearing more historic events from Christine Redonio. Let's give her a warm City Club welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm really in awe looking around the room and seeing all the um, accomplished and articulate people here. So I'm feeling a little pressure. Hopefully it won't show too much. But I do have to thank Jay and Ed for taking one bit of pressure off me, and that is they did the introductions. I was, I'm always so afraid I'm going to leave someone out. So well done, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, as was already mentioned in the uh, introduction, I am, I've been in, in the Senate since 1997, but I'm new to my position as leader of the Illinois Senate, Republicans. However, I am not the only new leader in the building right now. Since January 1st, we've had three inaugurations and one impeachment, which is, you know, a lot of change. <laughs> You know, we've had the inaugurations, obviously, of our own favorite son, Barack Obama, who, incidentally, I was a freshman with in the Illinois State Senate. Um, we have a new governor, Governor Quinn, and we also have all, the whole, all of the uh, General Assembly members are new as well, including um, the Senate President, John Cullerton. Now, all of this change has created um, a different sense of atmosphere in Springfield. 
I really believe that Governor Quinn, whether you agree with him or not, and we'll see as the session unfolds how much we agree with him, but you know what? He is a man that wants to do the right thing. His heart is in the right place, um, and he is about doing the business of the state and not about theatrics, and that in and of itself is a monumental leap forward. Yes. Yes. Senator Cullerton, likewise, who's the new Senate president, I believe is truly a student of public policy. Um, he's serious about the business of the state. Um, I certainly would not have described his predecessor quite in those terms. And so dealing with Senator Cullerton is refreshing. Um, he's certainly been easy to work with thus far, and I look forward to a very productive spring session. Now, because of the changes, there is this sense of hope and optimism as you walk the halls of the Capitol. You can almost feel it, you know, if you'd been there the last couple of years compared to what it's like now. And that's a really good thing because we need to bank all the hope and all the enthusiasm that we possibly can because of the incredible problems that are facing this state and that we're going to have to deal with shortly. I mean, the rubber really hits the road starting tomorrow. Um, when we go back into session. So far, we've been you know, just doing the more mundane kinds of legislative activities. It's been going very well so far, but we really haven't grappled with the big problems. Those are yet to come. There's really three major issues that I see us having to face in the next six weeks, and I hope it's not much more than six weeks. Um, hopefully, we're out of the mode of going year-round in the legislature. And those are the operating budget, ethics, and capital. So we're going to touch on all three of those, but first, just to sort of get you um, situated as to where the state's at, we do have a budget that's been acknowledged, depending on who you're talking to, of no less than $9 billion and maybe up to 11 or $12 billion in terms of, of deficit spending, and that's been supported by gimmicky financing. We have a huge backlog of unpaid bills and unprecedented state debt. And I know there's a number of people from the human service community here. I'm sure all of you know full well about what the um, problems have been with the backlog of unpaid bills. We simply are not paying many of our providers. Government's in a shambles. We've had a lot of really good, solid, professional people leave state government because of the frustrations over the last several years, which has meant that we're just not functioning very smoothly. There's been a loss of institutional memory. It's very difficult to get things done. Our pensions, as we know, are grossly underfunded. Our jobs climate is absolutely dismal. And if you look at some of the latest jobs figures, since March of 08 to March of 09, we lost 233,000 jobs in this state. And just in the last month, we've lost another nearly 40,000. Um, we are one of only five states that has fewer jobs today than we had 10 years ago, despite the fact, obviously, we've got some more population. Our unemployment is higher than the national average. We're at 9.1 percent. The national average is at 8.5. Citizens, and this is an important problem as we try to figure this out, have very little faith in their government and in the people who are governing. And on top of that, we have some major unmet capital needs that have, um, we haven't had a capital program in over 10 years. So we have, you know, a full plate of problems that we need to dig into. I want to start with talking a little about the operating budget. This is a problem, that 9 to $11 billion problem. Uh, it didn't crop up overnight, and it also is not just the result of the recession, which many people like to say. Illinois really was not in a very good position to handle the economic downturn because of some of the policies that have been in place for a while. If we, as we dig out, we have to understand, though, how is it that we got into that problem? Because if we don't figure that out, we're destined to repeat history. Illinois actually in the last five years has had $7 billion in new revenue come in the door. $7 billion growth in revenue, and yet we still have this incredible deficit. And that is a result of plain and simple overspending. And just to give you an illustration of the magnitude of that overspending, it's in the Medicaid program where in the last several years we've added 700,000 people to the Medicaid rolls. Now, there's only 12 million people in the state. That's a lot of people added. Yet, as a result of adding all those people, we only reduced the number of people who were uninsured or not covered by Medicaid by less than 1%. So what we've really done is incentivize people away from the private system into a state-supported system that is extraordinarily costly. So we have a spending problem. The spending, how do you do that? You spend more than comes in the door by gimmick financing, things like fund sweeps, 
fundraise, one-time revenues, and huge, huge amounts of borrowing against the future. So that's the, sort of the, the situation with the deficit as it stands right now. And what is happening, and you'll see this unfold, is the Democrats are using this as, a, as pressure in order to raise taxes. So kind of the first impulse out there is raise taxes, income tax, gas tax, cigarette tax, service taxes, business taxes, and fees. The whole focus is on spending and revenue. Now, I have to say, in some fairness, um, there has been some lip service paid, uh, lip service to date, I'm, I'm hoping that this will come to fruition, to cutting. And the governor actually proposed a citizen's board in his budget to identify cuts in government in order to implement those to save money. It does seem to me, however, if that's a genuine effort, we probably ought to hear the results of that before we raise taxes, not talk about cuts after the revenue is back. Doesn't make more, much sense. So the discussion to date has primarily been on cutting and, and revenue raising. Republicans, and what you'll be hearing is a theme throughout the next six weeks, is we have a little more multifaceted approach to the problem. Um, we, there's a couple of other things that we would like to add to the, the mix there. We do agree that the cuts need to be made, but once again, we need to make sure that we study those and make the cuts before we ask for more money. After all, that might impact whether or not we need more revenue or how much more revenue we need. But the other two prongs that we'd like to add to the problem solving is how do we reinvent government to give taxpayers more value for their dollars? And secondly, how do we grow the economy to produce revenue growth naturally without raising taxes on people that are currently paying. So let's talk first about what, what are some things that we might be able to do to reinvent government, which is something the private sector does all the time. When they're stressed for cash, they tighten their belts, they get more productivity, they're creative about how they do business in order to get more out of what they have available. Government typically isn't challenged to do that. We have such a bad situation right now, I'm hoping the silver lining is that we actually do take this opportunity to make some major systemic changes in state government. Now, to the governor's credit, he's proposed some pension reforms. Sorely, sorely needed. I will tell you, I am in support of a two-tiered pension system. We can no longer afford the system that we have in place. <laughs> As you can imagine, though, there is significant opposition to that, and that will be something that we will be talking about. But that's a good opportunity to do something right going forward. Um, in the health and human services field, a lot of opportunities for savings. Uh, managed care in Medicaid, and I told you how much we've expanded Medicaid. Illinois, if you read Cranes a week or so ago, um, has 10% of, of its population in managed care. Most states have at least 50, and our surrounding states are in the neighborhood of 60, 70%. Saves money, provides a medical home. But again, there's tremendous resistance to change. And interestingly, in this case, just, and this is not the sole basis of their opposition, but the hospital association is opposed. Now, you think about, well, why would that be? You're keeping people healthy, keep them out of the emergency room? Well, lo and behold, they get reimbursed for every emergency room visit. So there's a built-in reinforcement for the status quo, not to say that it's malicious or bad, but that's the kind of thing you're up against any time you suggest a change to anything. Somebody likes the status quo. Similarly, in human services, our state is far behind other states in terms of implementing community care for the disabled in, in our state. It's a much more cost-effective approach. It's one that the Supreme Court has told us we need to undertake to provide the least restrictive setting. We need to have a continuum of care, but we need to move away from the institutional side. Again, there's been a lot of resistance to doing that, but we have an opportunity because of the severity of our problems. When you look at the education equation, while it may not save money dollar for dollar right now, how about lifting the cap on charter schools, a, a system that's proven to... Thank you. That, I mean, it's proven to, to provide better results for the same money. I'm not even talking about saving, but there's opportunity here to do things better. Um, We've got this big backlog of back paid, of unpaid bills. We have an opportunity to change the law that allowed us to get into that situation in the first place. It's rather obscure, called Section 25 of the Finance Act. But this is an opportunity, if we're going to dig out, let's close that loophole so it doesn't happen again. So those are some of the kinds of things that we need to be talking about um, long before we talk about going back to our constituents and asking for more money. Now, in addition, we have to look at how we grow the economy. We have to look at those policies that have really hurt job growth in this state, and those are numerous. I mean, first of all, we've had the total vilification 
of the employer sector of the, uh, the economy. I mean, if you remember some of the rhetoric around the gross receipts tax about getting those nasty businesses to do their fair share and as if they were, you know, just the worst slugs of the earth, that's not good. We've had a terrible lack of stability, and we've had a sort of a mentality that the business community can be gone to for nickels and dimes. And, they, and consequently, a lot of cuts have been made that have been counterproductive, things like research and development, the employer training incentive program, which actually helps employers train people into good paying jobs with benefits, counterproductive to cut those kinds of things for a few cents on the dollar, and then consequently we end up with businesses moving out of state. And that's, in fact, exactly what has happened here. Actually, Representative Cross and I were um, able to get the governor to meet with a number of uh, business representatives, um, and he did that very graciously. There are probably about 40 to 60 people in the room from many different sectors, from banking to manufacturing, real estate, talking about what are the day-to-day -day concerns, what's going to hurt and help them retain and create jobs. They were very concrete and solid, and I can only hope that the governor will take heed of that as we go forward and talk about policies and how we raise revenue. Um, incidentally, anyone who read the Tribune this morning, the, that was very much um, what the editorial was saying, is let's be careful, let's view the business community as our partners in trying to dig out of this mess, not as the enemy. And I think that's very wise counsel. Um, we did pass, before the break, a mini capital plan at least to get people to work, to utilize this construction season. That was a very good thing, and we'll talk about that bigger capital plan in, in just a moment. That's one of the other big issues that we'll be dealing with this spring. So after the cuts, the increased efficiency, supporting natural revenue growth, only then, only then should we begin to talk about whether or not we need to raise revenue. And if so, how much? I certainly am not convinced that we need a percent and a half tax right now. I think that right now is a terrible time to be raising the income tax on both individuals and businesses. It's counterproductive. Uh, it's disastrous in this economy. It will harm employers. And again, it may not be that, the, that a company will move out of state, but there's plenty of small employers that will say, you know, if I have to have another percent tax, I'll just do without one more secretary. And that's the spiral of unemployment that, that brings you down and, and dampens natural revenue growth. So we need to be very careful about that. The other thing, though, that I think about all the time when I think about raising taxes is, how do I justify that to the people I represent? Do, can I go to my friends and neighbors and say, we really have done everything we can possibly do, or, or have we given up? And I just want to give you a little example of something that happened uh, last week. I had a bill. And you may recall the previous governor provided free rides for all seniors on mass transit. Kind of a whim. It was like, this is great. People said, oh, my gosh, where did that come from? But we, I guess we have to accept it because, uh, you know, otherwise the RTA won't be bailed out. Well, I, I had a bill that would have means-tested free rides for seniors. So if, if seniors need them, they have them. Under federal law, seniors only pay half price anyhow made perfect sense. I had this bill in committee, and we talked about it in committee, and every committee member agreed. Yeah, means testing does make sense. But at the end of the day, the bill was voted down in committee. It was voted down at party lines, and the articulated reason for voting against it was, well, oh, we don't want to make seniors mad. So to bring that back, my problem is, how do I go to my constituents and say, you know, I don't want to make the unions mad, I don't want to make the seniors mad, I don't want to make anybody mad, so just send some more money. I can't do that, and it's not fair, and people shouldn't be expected to do that. We need to do our part first. Now, we'll see how the discussions go over the next few weeks, um, and if the Democrats are willing to engage in some discussion about how we can do things different and better, they will find very willing partners um, with us, with us as Republicans. If they aren't, they have the votes to pass whatever they want, and then we'll have um, a discussion about that come election time. But I'm hopeful that we can make something positive out of, out of the disaster we have on our hands right now. 
Um, another thing that we will be working, we will be talking extensively about is the capital program. Um, I'm hoping that we can do a large capital program relatively quickly. First of all, there is consensus on the size. I mean, there does seem to be agreement we need to be in the $25 billion neighborhood for that particular program. Um, there does seem to be a better sense of trust, which was one of the impediments we had in previous years in getting a capital plan passed. And there are a number of revenue options that have been talked about. In fact, the Senate Republicans proposed a plan that ended road fund diversions and backfilled with gaming revenue. I understand gaming is controversial, but there are a number of other things on the table, and so, including some creative uses of the lottery. Um, gaming clearly is there. There has been the gas tax proposed. There's a lot of options. I believe that we could sit down and cobble together a revenue stream to support a capital plan and do it relatively quickly. The Republicans desperately want a capital plan. There was no greater advocate than Senator Watson. It passed out of the Senate twice in the last couple years with Republican votes on it. So we want to get that done. I really hope, however, that the capital plan does not get swept up and combined with the operating budget. That's going to make it immensely more difficult to pass. It's going to muddy up the works. And in my view, we need to do something proactive, positive. We ought to take that victory and run with it. And the fact of the matter is, because we then put people to work and we increase the demand all down the supply chain, having a good capital program could actually help us with the operating budget. Again, going back to maybe we don't need quite so much revenue. So I think it would make a great deal of sense for us to try to knock out that victory as soon as we get back. Finally, the, the other issue that we'll be um, dealing with is how to restore the faith of our citizens in their government. And I sincerely believe that getting a little solid progress on some of the issues that face the state would go a long way towards doing that instead of just continuing the circus that has been Springfield for the last several years. We definitely need to put the Rod Bogoyevich chapter behind us, despite the fact that he would not like us to do that. He keeps <laughs> resurfacing. <laughs> um, we do need reforms. Reforms will not solve everything. We need ethical officials. But we do, there are things that we can do, I think, that make it more difficult for unethical people to behave in unethical ways. There's a lot of discussion going on right now about various um, kinds of reforms. I hope we don't just pay lip service to them. Personally, I'm in favor of contribution limits for campaigns. Um, I have a somewhat higher level than the, um, than the uh, federal level, but I think it is something that when all but four states have done it, um, is probably something we ought to take a look at given our track record without them. I uh, certainly support pr proposals that prevent contracting abuses. We could use some more sunshine on the budget process. I'd like to see the primary date changed. And I especially would like to see the way redistricting is done um, in, a, in a less partisan way. I think that... You know, I think if it, that that is the one thing that might give us a more balanced system, and I think with more partisan balance, we have a much better public policy product at the end of the day. So I and my caucus are willing to work in a bipartisan fashion. I think that we've uh, earned our reputation as legislators who are willing to make tough decisions, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we will join in the discussion, but we will not completely ignore the fact that the Democratic majorities did enable the Blagojevich agenda. He didn't dig that hole all by himself. But we will try to help dig out of it, and we'll need to be vigilant. We'll need everyone's help in order to be, vi be vigilant and force accountability. The next six weeks are going to be very, very challenging. But I still have a sense, because of the new players and the new optimism, that we will be able to get something done. And I certainly pledge to you I will do my part to make sure that happens. So with that, I will stop, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, be thank you. Before we begin, um, questions on every table. There are some official question forms. We have people who collect these questions, so if you fill them out, and as my partner Paul Green says, who can't be with us today, legibility increases your chances of having your questions read, and no questions that go on for three or four pages. We have a, a question from uh, D. Meyer from the Civic Committee. As you know, Illinois is facing a significant financial crisis with both 
operating shortfalls and approximately over $120 billion of liabilities. Could you please outline the key reforms you believe should be addressed this session? Well, I think some of the things that I talked about, obviously I think we need to reform the, the pen, public pension system. I think that would be important. Um, Medicaid, uh, human service delivery. Um, again, there, there's other reforms in education other than just um, charter schools um, encouraging more consolidations. I think things we can do to try to tighten up and, and um, make the system better. Um, I would recommend doing all of those and hope we have a chance to do them. Okay. Um, this is from Grant Linsky, who's a member of our Board of Governors. A Senator, the Democrats have their left wing to contend with. You have your right wing. How do you see this playing out in 2009-2010? Well, you know, I think that when we talk about the right and left wing, we're generally talking more on social issues. Quite frankly, right now, the elephant in the room is, is the economics. And I will tell you that Republicans are pretty well unified in terms of what needs to happen in that regard. Um, you know, I think that the other issues as far as is um, when people come to Springfield to represent people, they need to vote their districts, they need to vote their conscience, and it's very difficult to make them vote in a way that is not consistent with their beliefs and their districts, and I would not try to do that. But I'm focused on what brings us together, and that's the economics right now. Thank you. Um, this is from Marty Gleason, City Club member. <clears throat> as the state tax system is overhauled, what are the chances of a tax swap to reduce property taxes by raising the state income tax to fund schools? I would not be in favor of that as an isolated change. I mean, if, if we're going to go to a different system um, of funding schools, ones that, that's more centralized, we need to do a lot of change all the way through the system, including consolidation of school districts, because decision-making will become more centralized if funding becomes more centralized. I do realize property taxes are a, are a huge burden on people, and we need to figure out a way to strategically give relief to people that cannot afford them. But the beauty of property taxes, and there are a few, it's stable and predictable. I mean, can you imagine if our schools were um, having to do the same things our human service providers are doing, they going to the bank to borrow money in order to make payroll? You know, local money is at least uh, stable and predictable. Um, and the fact is, the control is local. So there are some positives, um, but we would need a pretty massive overhaul to, to affect that swap. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, just like when we um, sponsor the City Club on Monday evenings, there's a short uh, break, and here's one to acknowledge the former CTA chairman, Jim McDonough. Jim, we're sorry we didn't recognize you earlier. Ah, this is from um, our group sitting down here, Judy Bartopinka, Stella Black, Kathy Posner, Jill Zwick, former state rep. Senator. Has Pate Phillip congratulated you on heading up the Senate GOP caucus? Well, I'm still waiting for that call. <laughs> Thank you. Remember, we have a over a hundred year tradition of being very fair and objective and uh, and irreverent. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this is from uh, Bruce Dumont, our city club member. What priority will the state give to, quote, shovel-ready green, end quote, capital projects? Well, I think with the stimulus money, the concept of shovel-ready was very important because we want to get those projects out the door and get things moving to stimulate the economy. Um, with the larger capital bill, obviously the Department of Transportation and the various departments through which projects will be allocated will be prioritized, I, I think, hopefully within programs that exist, you know, the, the road program and so on. And it is my hope that we do not have a lot of lump sums, which are that's code talk for pork, that we allow the professionals in IDOT, the professionals in, in the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, the professionals at the State Board of Ed to um, help us with prioritization rather than handing out money um, to individual legislators. There's some wonderful questions here. Uh, this is from Dick Johnson, who's with the State University's Annuitants Association. And Dick's question is, Governor Quinn's goal is to have a quote-unquote real balanced budget. 
How can that happen when there is talk of yet another shortchanging the state's dreadfully underfunded pension systems? Catelli's University retiree because it's hard to read the question. Yeah, that's a, that is a very good point to make. The governor proposed the pension changes, but once again is proposing taking all the savings up front and underfunding them this year. That is a bad way to go. That's what got us into the problem to begin with. You know, I think if we could get a long-term financial plan, begin to get things, you know, stability um, brought back into the financial picture, um, Frankly, we may have to look again at the ramp that we've got and whether or not it's sustainable. But just taking year-over-year -year holidays because we're desperate for the cash that we can save is absolutely the wrong way to go, and I hope we don't support that. Okay, this is from uh, Steve Schneider. Steve asks, Senator, why is it so difficult to measure the state's financial deficit? Well, it's big. It's just big. I mean, you know, it depends on what you count and what day you're counting the, the deficit on. But um, I haven't heard less than nine. I haven't heard more than 12. Um, the point is, it's, it's extraordinarily significant, and I think that's more important than what the specific dollar amount is. Thank you. Uh, this is from Ed Cooper. Um, Senator, I've heard the legislature might roll back the 10% Cook County sales tax. Can you comment, please? My guess is that would be unlikely that that would happen, honestly. And it wouldn't be rolled back 10% because, of course, the state already gets, um, you know, six and a quarter. But um, I actually had a, I, don't, I can't remember if we got it in bill form, but a cap on, on the amount that a locale could charge in sales tax. Um, you know, obviously, the Cook County is, is an extreme situation with the highest sales tax in the nation. It's hurting the economy here. Um, it's hurting the retail here. And so hopefully the county board will realize that and roll it back on its own. Short of that, maybe they'll elect people to the county board that will do that for them. And Ed, there's a little footnote here. If you want further explanation on this, you could talk to Commissioner Suffredin after the meeting. Uh, for my White Sox seatmate, Don Clark Netch. Uh, Senator, are you willing to look at another revenue reform broadening the sales tax to cover some services? Yeah, I'm open. You know, I, I like to say I'm open to anything. The, the difficulty with um, broadening the tax base to include services is that sometimes there's unintended consequences. It's easy in some services to drive the service underground. I mean, imagine, you know, barbershops and haircut and car repair. I mean, do you end up driving people off the books? And so I think um, if we go down that road, we'll need to be very careful about looking at other states' experiences and, and checking carefully as to what the ramifications of that service tax is. In many instances, it's simply a pass-through to people um, for services they're paying less for right now. Thank you. This is from uh, Sharon Alter, and uh, Sharon would like to know, when do you want the primary elections to occur, back to March or in the fall, and, this is very interesting, why do you want the changed date? Well, the primary reason I'm interested in the change date is I think the campaign season is just too long. Um, my thought was June, which is neither of the ones you mentioned. I think the fall, the September proposal, is too close to the election. doesn't give people time to do a good general election campaign. But I think February um, is just, it makes the, the, the season way too long. I think regardless of the date, Incumbents do have an advantage. I mean, there's, I don't think there's any way we're going to neutralize that. Um, but I do believe that the good candidates um, could function within a shortened primary season. Okay, we have two last questions. Uh, this is from City Club member Mo Hethington uh, from Stand Up Save Lives campaign. Senator, thank you for your history of commitment to a clean and healthy environment over the years. Do you think we can embrace energy issues and also reduce the health impacts of polluting industries? Well, certainly, as, as the questioner knows, I've been very committed to those issues um, over many years, um, whether it was clean coal plants or um, we got our start, actually, in some of those issues. Um, 
Yeah, I think we're very interested in that. Quite frankly, though, right now, we're not talking about school funding, big environmental issues. We are focused on our financial problem. Until we get that straightened out, we really, I don't think, can deal effectively with almost anything else. I mean, we, we have got to get the financial house in order because, quite frankly, that's what drives all the other policy decisions. Um, so while I'm certainly interested in those and will continue to the extent I can, I think the focus right now is, like, how do we get back on track here? Thank you, Senator. Our final question is from City Club uh, Board of Governors member Joyce Saxon. You know, we've set a record here at the City Club. Club. We had the Congressman Mark Kirk speak last week, and now you. That's two Republicans in a row. I'm sure Roebling will check the annals for the last 104 years. Hasn't happened in a few years. Okay. So she is a pathbreaker, right. The question is, if Congressman Kirk runs for governor, who do you see taking the nomination, Republican nomination, for the U.S. Senate? Wow, I have, <laughs> you know, this is an interesting time of year because everybody's jockeying for position and trying to figure out where they might go or where the openings are. I mean, I can't imagine um, who that would be. I'm sure it's, you know, anyone who's talking about a statewide office right now would take a look at that seat if it were to open up. So um, I, I would not begin to predict that. <laughs> okay, well, one thing that we can predict is that um, we have several items we would like to present to the senator. One is an honorary one-year membership in the City Club. Thank you. And then our famous centennial history. She spoke of ethics reform. This is much less than $50 or whatever, so you don't have to worry about anything. And last but not least, the City Club mug. Thank you to Senator Redonio.